Hello and uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, this lecture is on conditional probability. Okay, so so far we've been talking about uh, uh, probability space where we had an experiment and an outcome. Yes, but and then we had the sample space was very important, and then there was this collection of events that we had, and then we had this probability function which needed to satisfy these axioms, and we were able to do calculations with events and all that already more and more interesting problems we are trying to see. We are seeing more complicated uh, sample spaces. We saw the derangement example last time. It, it seems a little more complicated than what we are used to. And uh, slowly we are gaining expertise on handling more and more complicated probability spaces. Okay? So now this conditional probability is a hugely powerful tool. Okay? So this will give you the power to take a very large probability space and sort of break it down into smaller pieces different pieces in various different ways and still compute probability in a correct consistent manner. Okay, so it's an extremely powerful tool, it's easily one of the uh, most powerful uh, ideas in probability, a lot of people call it the heart and soul of probability, some of them. It's, it's uh, very, very central to a lot of things we'll do in this class, okay, in our, even in this program, you know, the whole data science program relies a lot on this notion of conditional probability for its theoretical backing. Okay, so let's get started. So, so, so the motivation, there's various ways to motivate it. So I'm going to provide this motivation for you. And this is a good way to think about how probab condition probability enters the picture. There, there, are, there are various other reasons also, but this is one way of thinking about it. So quite often, the, when an experiment is complex, it's complex because there are a sequence of actions. Okay, it's not just one action happening once and you're done. And uh, there's usually a sequence of actions. I've, I've given you an example here. You may toss a coin three times, right? You're repeating the toss. You may throw a die two times. Or you can look at the IPL example, right? So we've been doing this Indian Premier League cricket tournament example throughout. If you think of one over in IPL, it's first delivery, and then the second delivery, and then the third delivery, right? So it just repeats. Every time you think of a complicated experiment, it appears like things repeat quite often. Okay, so while you start with, before anything starts, before even the first action, you start with a very big probability space. After the first action, it appears that the number of possibilities, number of outcomes has shrunk a little bit. Of course, it depends on what happened in the first uh, step, but nevertheless, it seems to have shrunk. You, you, can, you can take an example, right? So you, you're causing a toy in three times. Now, after you've tossed it once, things have reduced in possibility, right? You're only tossing two times more. Same thing with the die also. So once you throw it once, you're only throwing it once more, right? So things have shrunk a little bit. It seems like the probability, uh, the number of possibilities, number of outcomes, everything is shrinking, okay? So you start with an initial probability space and you observe the first step. Now, so now you, you've observed a part of your outcome in the probability space, right? So it's not like before, something has changed. And uh, the question in conditional probability and this idea of conditioning is, can you now work with a smaller probability space for the rest of the outcomes and still meaningfully compute probability in the original uh, probability space? Okay, so that's the critical idea. Uh, it's sort of a divide and conquer type of approach and all these divide and conquer type of approaches are really, really powerful. They're powerful in real life, they're powerful in theory also. Okay, so, so let's see a specific example. I've been talking about this in a slightly more abstract way. Let's take a sim simple example. Toss a coin three times, right? So if you look at the initial sample space, it's got eight different possibilities. I've written it down here, H, H, H to T, 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 right? So all the eight different possibilities are there. Now, uh, if you focus on the first toss, uh, let's say we define an event B, which is that the first toss is tails, okay? The first toss results in tails. And let's say we observed event B, okay, we've observed the first step in the experiment, we observed event B, event B has occurred, somebody has told you that, okay. So the question, like I've been asking, can we divide now, can we, can we say, okay, I've observed this, can I make my probability space smaller? And we've seen when probability space is smaller or easier to deal with, we can do computations more easily. When and it's unwieldy and big, it seems very confusing, but maybe we can break it down in steps, it seems uh, easier for us to work with. Okay, so the answer to that question is yes, because once you've observed B, B itself becomes like the sample space. Like what is B? B is 
uh, THH, comma THT, comma TTH, comma TTT, right? The, that itself becomes a sample space. Why is that? Because once P has occurred, you're inside B. One of the four things is going to happen from now on, right? I know the first toss resulted in a tail. So one of these four things only are a possibility. And what is that? That is exactly B, okay? So when an event occurs and you want to proceed after that sort of in the next step or, you know, think of what's going to happen after that, you can sort of restrict yourself to B itself, right? When an event occurs, the event itself becomes the sample space for the subsequent steps in the experiment, okay? Now, what about events in the smaller sample space? What about probability function for the smaller sample space, right? We have to do some redefinition, right? So, so all that is not clear. I'm just trying to motivate. It's, it's, um, it's not clear as to how to do that. And uh, that is where conditional probability comes in. So, conditional probability gives you a way to deal with this smaller sample space in a very clean, meaningful way so that it ties up nicely with the larger sample space that you started with initially, okay? So if you want to understand from a high level what is it that we'll do in conditional probability, this last statement is probably a good indicator, okay? So you have an initial probability space and then you observe an event. When you observe an event, you can, any event, you can split that initial probability space into that event that occurred, right? That's something event and some sort of a conditional probability space given that the event occurred, okay? So this conditional probability space we are yet to define. We haven't defined it. It seems to be a bit of a challenge. Maybe the sample space is easy to identify, but what about events? What about probability function in that conditional sample space, conditional probability space? It's not clear how to do that, right? We will do that in the subsequent slides in this lecture, okay? So this is the high level idea. We're going to do some sort of a divide and conquer approach and everything hinges on the fact that we observed an event, okay? So and this notion of somehow there's a sequence of actions. So even after observing an event, you've not fully found the outcome, okay? If when you observe the event, you've fully found the outcome, then there's nothing much to happen after that, right? So your experiment should be complicated enough that after observing one event, there is still something left to, you know, discover or some more actions that have to happen. And in that case, you can shrink to the conditional probability space. And this conditional probability space is a different probability space from the original one but the probability you calculate in that can be tied up to the original probability. Okay, so that's the crucial idea. Uh, let's see how to do that. Uh, we'll see the theoretical way of doing it properly with the equations and all that, and then we'll see a few examples to drive home the point of how conditional probability works, okay? So this is uh, sort of the formal definition of a conditional probability space. So we always have these pictures of the Venn diagram, keep that in mind, the image and the picture is very important. It gives you an intuitive feel for what it is we're doing, okay? So let's start with the probability space. What is our probability space? The familiar world of a sample space, yes, which is the set of all outcomes. Then your collection of events, which could be the set of all subsets of the sample space for now. And then the probability function P, right? What does the probability function do? P, it assigns to every event in your original probability space some number between zero and one on this has to be consistent with the two axioms, right? So the, all that is assumed when we say that, okay? So that's a nice thing about this definition, right? We, we saw all this and now when I say sample space, events, probability function, you know what it all means, okay? Now, let's say there is an event B, okay? And it has to happen with some positive probability. If there's no chance that the event B occurs, if B is a null set or something, then I think there's no meaning in, uh, you know, observing that because you never observe B if, if it had no chance of happening, okay? So B has to be an event with probability greater than zero. Okay, so this is the picture. Okay, so the picture here uh, is good to keep in mind. Uh, okay. Picture here is good to keep in mind. You have the sample space S, which is this big oval, and then you have the event B, which is this oval here, right? So this is the event B. I've shown a few other events here. I'll come to that soon enough, but this is where uh, B is, and probability of B, P of B, the probability function, uh, assigns a non-zero probability to the event P, okay? So here's the definition of a conditional probability space given B, okay? So from this picture, we can sort of invent or create another probability space. And what is this probability space? We're going to give it a special sort of name. It's called the conditional probability space given B, okay? So you have to imagine that this experiment happened and part of it you've observed and that part of it is somehow uh, connected with this event B, okay? So that's the idea, okay? Now, what is the sample space of this conditional probability space given B? It's B itself, 
okay. So that is the simple idea B occurred. So you have sort of moved into this sample space, your whole sample space has become B itself, okay. Now what are the events now? What are the events in this smaller sample space? You have a whole bunch of events in the original sample space, isn't it? A1, A2, A3, let us say all the possible events, you list them all of them one after the other, okay. The events in the new sample space are simply the intersections of the original events in the original space with B, okay. If you have an event A in the original space, you simply take A intersect B. So that gives you all the events in the new probability space we are constructing, right. We are constructing a new sample sp uh, probability space, we you know given B, so we went with our sample space to B itself and now what, what happens to our events? You take the original events and then you intersect with B, okay. Now comes the all important probability function. What probabilities will you assign to the events in this conditional probability space and what, what name will you give it, okay. So that is what is important. Uh, the, the probability function that we will use in this new probability space is P of A intersect B divided by P of B. So this is a very, very crucial and important and interesting definition, okay. To every set in this new conditional probability set, to, to, to every event in this new conditional uh, probability space, we will, we have to assign a probability function and this probability function will assign this probability to it, okay. Notice, notice the subtle change here, it is not just P of A intersect B. Why is it not P of A intersect B? P of A intersect B is the probability in the original space. That, that does not really translate into the probability function in the conditional space, okay. You have to divide by P of B. This is P of B division is very, very crucial, okay. Otherwise, uh, notice what will happen, your axioms will not be satisfied for this new probability space. What is the axiom? Look at axiom 1, right? Uh, P of B, the, in the conditional probability space, the new probability function should assign a probability of 1 to B, okay? So if instead of A, if I put B here, what is P of B intersect B? It is B itself. So P of B by P of B, I get 1, right? So this P of B is simply doing an adjustment to make sure that axiom 1 is satisfied, okay. Notice why this definition is motivated very cleanly. Uh, notice quite a few things, this, this is a tricky definition. Uh, you can you can sort of take it as a definition and not worry about it anymore. Uh, but, but I want you to think about it a little bit more. We, we have an original probability function P, which was assigning probabilities to all these, you know, events A intersect B, B, etc. Now, we define these new events inside my conditional probability space, okay. And to every event in this conditional probability space, I am going to assign a new probability and that one is P of A intersect B divided by P of B. And notice how this becomes consistent with what a new probability space should be, right. So if you put instead of A, if you put B, you get P of B by P of B, that is 1, okay. So, 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 so in the new probability function, you have a proper probability space, okay, it, it satisfies all the axioms, okay. So this ratio P of A given A intersect B divided by P of B, okay, it is denoted P of A given B. So that bar is, uh, you know, this bar is read as given, okay. So P of A given B, okay, and it is called the conditional probability of A given B, okay. A lot of people will drop the word conditional instead of saying conditional probability of A given B, P of A given B, they will just say P of A given B. P of A given B is simply the conditional probability of A given B and it is defined as P of A intersect B divided by P of B, okay. So once again, this, this definition is also rewritten a little bit. P of A intersect B is P of B times P of A given B, is that okay? So notice this uh, subtle change in notation and way in which we uh, confuse people a lot. This P was the original probability function, right. Now the same P is used but instead of A alone, we put this A given B, okay. So this complicated uh, argument which is like some A given B enters this P and that makes it a conditional probability, okay. So this P of A given B is called a conditional probability, it is defined as P of A intersect B divided by P of B and uh, it, it also is simply given by this uh, nice little succinct formula here, 
okay. So, let us go in and look at uh, what this means in terms of the Venn diagram, okay. We have this event B which is inside the sample space S and we have a whole bunch of other events A1, A2, A3, etc. What is my sample space? The conditional sample space so to speak, you know, it is B itself and what are my events inside this new conditional probability space? All these intersections that we had, we had these intersections with A1, A2, A3, etc. And what are the probabilities for each of these things? The probability for each of these things is, uh, let me just make sure I get the A1, A2, A3 right. Probability of each of these things, this one is P of A1 intersect P divided by P of B. Okay, so this is in the, this is the new conditional probability space given B. Okay, and this guy is probability of A2 intersect B divided by probability of B. Notice this P is the original space. Okay, so this one is probability of A3 intersect B divided by P of B. Okay, so this guy is what? This is P of A3 given B. All right. So, so if you if you think about it, the way I introduced it, I went from the initial space to the conditional space. Right. Quite often in problems, you'll be surprised to see that the conditional space is much much easier to deal with than the original space. Okay. So you will want an event in the original space, and it'll be a complicated deal with. But you will use the conditional space, and the conditional space is very obvious to deal with. You know, you know what to do with p of a given b. Okay. So, both ways are used in an exchangeable way. So, it, right now it feels like you know the way I write it, I write P of A3 given B as P of A3 given intersect P divided by P of B. This is if the original probability space is easy to deal with. You know all these things in the original space, you can take the ratio and find the conditional probability. Quite often what will happen is the conditional space is very, very easy to deal with and P of B is easy to deal with, but P of A intersect B is very tough in the original space. So, people compute it like this. So, both ways it is used and I know this is sounding a bit abstract when, when I do problems in uh, examples I will point out how you can move to the conditional space and sort of know how to calculate the conditional probability directly without uh, doing this and, and get the original events back in a very interesting way. Okay, So, that is how we will use conditional probability that is the divide and conquer approach is not it. I want I want a probability in a complicated uh, probability space pretty big multiple actions etc. So, I simply condition go to a smaller one find the probability there and then come back to the original probability space and how do I do it, how do I go back and forth between these things is the key. Okay? So, initially it may sound like a lot of things going on at the same time, if you get enough practice, once you get enough practice, you will do this so smoothly in your head. Okay? So, all of this conditioning and going to the conditional space, doing the calculation there, coming back to the original one, adding it up here, there, etc. A lot of laws that help you here and you will do it in your head automatically very fast. When you do that, you do not have to know all this theory too much. I mean, this theory is just written down uh, for, for putting it in a clear context. Once you start doing it, you, you will hardly, uh, you know, keep looking at this theory and all that. You just do it in your head and go through forward. Okay? So, as we work it out, pay attention to this, you will see how easy it is to work with conditional probability.